Welcome, everybody. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce Jordan Pierce. He's a master's student in the oceanography program at UNH. Uh, Jordan joined the center in August of 2018. And prior to that, he completed his undergraduate studies as, at Texas A&M um, in geographic information systems. And then he went on to teach English to high school students in Shenzhen, China. I hope I pronounced that correctly. We'll see. Um, and worked as a research assistant in designing artificial substrates um, at the University of Hong Kong. Um, since beginning at the center, uh, Jordan has really become an expert, I would say, in, uh, in speaking at virtual conferences. <laughs> He's done quite a bit of that <laughs> and has experienced, I believe, and Jordan, you'll have to tell me if I'm wrong, for the first time, um, a winter with snow that stays for longer than an hour or two on the ground mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in New Hampshire, um, which he has thoroughly enjoyed. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, so today, uh, Jordan will be talking about automating the boring stuff, a deep learning and computer vision workflow for coral reef habitat mapping. And I should say that, uh, and I just want to point out to that um, Yuri and Kim and I have all been uh, advising Jordan. So uh, yeah, good luck. Cool. Thanks, Jen. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank everyone for coming. I really do appreciate it. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, to Just to reiterate, my name is Jordan Pierce. I'm a master's student studying oceanography. And for my thesis, I looked at ways to automate the mapping of coral reefs, both in 2 and 3D, using deep learning and computer vision algorithms. So obviously, ecology is much more complex than what I show here. I just wanted to present that of the general process, this is the part that I am most interested in. So my goal was actually to develop tools and technologies to make it easier for ecologists so that they don't have to spend all of their time doing boring stuff and instead they can focus on what really matters. Specifically, I was interested in automating the annotation of images collected from benthic quadrat habitat surveys. And if you're not familiar, this is when while scuba diving, researchers will go out to a reef and they'll lay out a transect line across the surface. They'll swim along it and stop at random intervals and they'll take out this square PVC quadrat that they're carrying and sort of throw it haphazardly. And wherever it falls, they'll take an image of the contents. They'll do this many times, taking many high resolution images. These are then uploaded into a point-based annotation software tool where potentially hundreds of points are projected onto each image and the researcher is tasked with labeling every single one. Now from these labels and through the power of statistical analysis, coverage statistics relating to abundance and diversity can be estimated. But this creates a bottleneck in the entire process because it's really easy to go out and collect lots of images, but it requires a substantial amount of time and effort and money to label them. So ideally, this part of the entire process would be automated, and to some extent, it already has been. So since deep learning became popular around 2012, many researchers have been trying to automate this task using different types of convolutional neural networks. Typically, they compare their algorithms using what's called the Morea labeled coral data set, which is currently one of the most common benchmark data sets for coral reef image classification. In fact, there's even an entire website called CoralNet, which will attempt to provide labels to these types of images automatically through the use of machine learning algorithms. However, the issue with all of these existing methods is that uh, they only provide sparse labels. They work by sampling the image and extracting a patch, which they then pass to the classifier to classify just the centermost pixel. Now this works, but if you have an image that's about 12 megapixels in resolution and you only provide about 200 sparse labels, then really you're only annotating about 0.0016% of the entire image. So for my thesis, I instead uh, worked on developing a more efficient method of obtaining dense labels, which as you can see on the image on the right, is when every single pixel is provided with a semantic label. So today I present to you my thesis, which is comprised of three individual chapters, each of which builds off the previous. And the first, I make improvements to an existing algorithm that converts the sparse labels associated with an image into dense labels automatically. I then conduct a series of experiments in which I compare the original implementation against my own. 
In the second chapter, I showcase to benthic ecologists how this improved implementation could be useful to them in automating the annotation of these types of images. Using the Morea labeled coral data set, I use deep learning algorithms to perform semantic segmentation on novel images. And finally, in chapter three, I transition from classifying 2D images to 3D photogrammetric models, where I use techniques from the previous two chapters to do so. It's a lot of talking, sorry. So before we get to how you convert sparse into dense labels, I want to introduce to you an over-segmentation algorithm called Simple Linear Iterative Clustering, or SLIC. Simply put, this and other over-segmentation algorithms aggregate the individual pixels of an image into visually homogeneous regions called superpixels. They work by treating each pixel in the image as a data point and then clusters them together based off shared similarities of color value and location. So pixels that are clustered together in feature space form superpixels within image space. And because there's a finite amount of pixels in the image, there's a trade-off between the number of superpixels that form and their relative size. So for example, if we increase the number of superpixels, each one gets smaller. Now, say we have an image and we have some existing sparse labels that were provided by a trained expert, and we segment that image into some number of superpixels. We could then propagate the class of the label to all of the other pixels within the same superpixel. And this works, but there are some issues, like how do you determine how many superpixels should be formed a priori? Because if you look at the image, some superpixels are too large and therefore they encompass multiple class categories, meaning that some pixels will be incorrectly labeled. But if the superpixels are too small and there aren't enough sparse labels, then most pixels are left unannotated. So the solution to this problem was instead to segment the image multiple times where during the first iteration, many superpixels are formed, which captures the fine scale details between neighboring semantic groups. And then for each successive iteration, that number decreases to ensure that all pixels are provided with at least one label. Then after all of the iterations, the labels made from each are combined together to create a set of dense labels. And what's nice about this algorithm is it only requires three parameter values from the user, which are the number of superpixels to form during the first and last iteration, as well as the total number of iterations. To calculate the number of superpixels for all of the other iterations, you just use equation one. So for my first chapter, I made an improved version of this algorithm, which I refer to as FastMSS. The first improvement I made was a complete overhaul on how the algorithm was written and I included a super to use API written entirely in Python. I also used a different over segmentation algorithm. I used a variant called FastSlick, which performs just wickedly fast, even on an ordinary CPU due to optimization techniques. And finally, I changed how the labels made from each iteration are combined together. So I treated these as entries into a three dimensional data structure or stack, where the shape is equal to the height and width of the original image and the depth is equal to the number of iterations. By thinking about it like this, I could create a set of dense labels by calculating the statistical mode of class labels across the third dimension of the stack. So after creating FastMSS, I then compared it to the original implementation using a CAMVID semantic segmentation benchmark data set. This one consists of 600, uh, sorry, 600 one megapixel images that are comprised of 14 different class categories. These are things that you would see while walking down the street, such as cars, uh, buildings, and maybe other pedestrians. And for each image, there is a ground truth set of dense labels that were created manually by a trained expert. So my comparison, uh, sorry, my experiment consisted of three trials in which I compared uh, my implementation against the other. To do this, I had three trials in which I synthesized sparse labels by uniformly sampling some percentage of the ground truth for each image. So for example, the first trial, I synthesized sparse labels by sampling 1% of all of the pixels in the image. For the second trial, it was 0.5%, and for the third, it was 0.1%. Then for each trial, I passed the synthesized sparse labels to both implementations, and they generated their own versions of dense labels. Uh, for the MSS, I used the original code provided by the authors, and I used their recommended values for this same data set. For mine, for FastMSS, I did a grid search to determine the optimal parameter values. These dense labels were then compared to the ground truth using pixel accuracy, which is the number of correct instances over the total number of instances, 
mean pixel accuracy, which is just pixel accuracy per class averaged together unweighted, and then mean intersection over union, which is the true positives over the sum of true positives, false positives, and false negatives. And for each uh, metric, it ranges between zero and one, where one represents a perfect score. So for the results, I have table one. You can see that I have the percentage and number of sparse labels synthesized for each trial, the classification scores, and then also the speed of both implementations. For pixel accuracy, there was no difference between either two implementations for any of the three trials, but for mean pixel accuracy, Fastmus has performed better in all three, but only in the last two for mean intersection over union. With regards to speed, Fastmus uh, performs significantly faster, anywhere between eight and 10 times. So from this chapter, I have two key takeaways for you. The first being that based off this experiment, FastMS has performed faster and with higher classification scores, which translates to it creates more accurate dense labels. Also, there seems to be a positive correlation between the number of sparse labels associated with an image and the resulting classification scores of the dense labels made by FastMSS. And this is important for chapter two in which I further validate FastMSS performance using the Morea labeled coral data set. So the MLC data set was uh, released in 2012 and it currently serves as the most widely used benchmark data set for coral reef image classification. It consists of about 2000 images that were taken of the same sites across three different years, which includes 2008, 2009, and 2010. Uh, and for each image, there's about 200 sparse labels associated with them that were provided manually by a trained expert. And because this is a benchmark data set, it also outlines three patch-based image classification experiments that use nine of the most abundant class categories, making up about 92% of all of the sparse labels. Now at this point, it would be fairly easy just to take each image and the sparse labels pass them to FastMSS, which would then automatically generate a corresponding set of dense labels. And by doing this, I could showcase to ecologists how FastMSS could be useful in augmenting their existing data sets. And also, because the labels are dense, they could calculate more robust coverage statistics. However, the major issue with this algorithm is that it still requires sparse labels. And therefore, if they don't exist, the researcher still has to make them. So for this chapter, I instead focused on developing or showcasing a way to ecologists how they could obtain dense labels for novel images. I used the images in the MLC data set and dense labels made by FastMSS to form a training data set, which I then used to train another deep learning algorithm. This is called a fully convolutional network, and it's used to perform semantic segmentation on computer vision. Uh, it's a computer vision algorithm, sorry. Now with this, researchers could go back to the same or similar habitats that they were previously working on. They could collect additional images and then feed them to the FCN, which would then provide dense labels both quickly and automatically without any effort on the user's part. Pretty nice, right? Uh, but through this process, I ran into uh, some problems. The first, as you can see, um, based on the chart, the number of sparse labels that are associated with each image in the MLC data set is significantly less than what I had used during any of the comparisons with the CAMPIT data set. So to increase the number of sparse labels for each image, I actually use the convolutional neural network technique that I talked about during the introduction to first learn from the training images. And then I used it to provide additional sparse labels to each image in the training sets. If you're not familiar, a CNN is a popular type of deep learning algorithm used for image classification. This means that for each image you provide it, it will output a single label corresponding to what it thinks is in the image. It does this by learning the characteristic features that tend to be associated with the class categories that it was trained on. By using a hierarchy of linear filters, low level features such as differences in colors, lines and edges are found towards the beginning of the network. They are then passed to deeper layers where you find mid-level features. These are things like shapes and patterns. Eventually, we find high-level features which resemble something that we might be able to identify. These are found towards the end of the network. So through this distillation process, the information in the original image is reduced into a smaller but uh, more representative format, which is then passed to the fully connected layers. These take the information from the encoder and create a nonlinear classification model 
which outputs a probability distribution that indicates the probability that the image belongs to one of the class categories it was previously trained on. Okay. Now, for each experiment, I extracted patches from the, training from the training images where the patches were centered on ground truth sparse labels. These formed a data set that I then used to train a CNN. Once it was trained, I went back to every single image in the training data sets and I extracted about 2,000 patches following a grid formation. These were then fed to the classifier's input, and for each patch, the classifier output a vector representing a probability distribution where the indice with the highest value corresponded to the presumed class label. Now, I know this classifier is not gonna be 100% accurate, uh, definitely not, so I set two conditions. The first was that the top one choice needs to be higher than the top two choice and by a significant margin. For this, I chose a confidence threshold value of 0.5 after performing an extensive visual assessment. However, even with a high degree of confidence, this thing's still gonna be wrong sometimes. So the second condition was the presumed class label in question needed to already be within the list of ground truth labels for that particular image. And my reasoning for this is I trust the original human annotator way more than I trust this classifier, although it is pretty good. So with these two conditions, about 85% of all of the sparse labels were accepted, representing about an additional 1,700 per image. Now, at this point, I've got two sets of sparse labels, one that was created by the original human annotators and the other, which was made by this classifier. Now, because the MLC, oh, sorry, uh, I passed these to FastMSS, which then generated two versions of dense labels, two sets of dense labels. Now, because the MLC dataset does not have ground truth in the form of dense labels, at this point, there was no way for me to quantitatively verify which of these was actually more accurate. So what I did is I used these two sets of dense labels to train two sets of fully convolutional networks whose uh, accuracy on the test sets for the experiments they were trained on would provide some validation for this technique. Now, if you're not familiar, an FCN, a fully convolutional network, is a type of deep learning algorithm used for semantic segmentation. This means that for each image you give it, it outputs an image of the same size, but each pixel holds a semantic label that it's thought to belong to. Like a CNN, an FCN also has an encoder, but instead of these fully connected layers, these guys are truncated and replace what is called a decoder. Now, in this network, the encoder works exactly the same in that it distills information by learning to intelligently downsample the image into a condensed but more representative format. However, during this process, the spatial relationship between pixels is lost and the resolution is of course drastically reduced. So the decoder's job is essentially to undo this by learning to intelligently interpolate the information that it is provided by the encoder. And it does this with assistance of skip connections, which takes information in the decoder, sorry, the encoder, and transfers it to the corresponding uh, layers within the decoder. Uh, and again, the output of this network is a set of dense labels or a segmentation map of the input image. So for this chapter, I followed the same experimental setup that was first outlined by Baybaum et al. 2012, where I split up the data for each experiment in the following ways. For experiment one, uh, two thirds of the 2008 images were used for training and the other third was used for testing. I used k-fold cross-validation with k equal to three and then average scores together. For experiment two, all 2008 images were used for training and all of 2009 were used for testing. And finally, for experiment three, all of 2008 and 2009 were used for training and 2010 was used for testing. Each FCN that I experimented with was trained with the training images associated with the experiment using either set of dense labels made by FastMSS. And training basically consists of passing the image through the network, which uh, then predicts, or sorry, calculates the error between the predicted output and the FastMSS labels. And then with that, or with that error, each parameter in the model is then adjusted by an amount that is proportional to the error that it was responsible for using back propagation. So this process was repeated for 20 epochs in which the model was shown all of the training samples 20 different times. And if you have questions about how I trained the model or the hyperparameters that I chose to use, please feel free to ask after the talk. I would genuinely like to discuss it.
Um, following the training process, each FCN was then evaluated on its test set. So it, test images were passed through the train model, which output a corresponding set of dense labels. But because, again, the MLC data set only has ground truth in the form of sparse labels, these were compared to the labels and the corresponding pixel indices of the FCN's predictions for the same image. So with these two sets of sparse labels, I could compute the classification accuracy, the precision, and recall. Now, if you're not familiar with these metrics or you're like me and you forget literally all the time which one is which, um, I'll explain really quickly. Hopefully you're familiar with the boy who cries wolf. Uh, in this case, a true positive is when the boy cries wolf and the wolf is there. A false positive is when the boy's being a turd and he cries wolf, but the wolf's not really there. Uh, a false negative is when the boy's incompetent, and fails to cry wolf when the wolf is there. And a true negative is when the boy doesn't cry because the wolf's just not there. Again, accuracy, it's exactly what you think it is. It's the number of correct instances over the total number of instances. Precision here represents of the times the boy cried, how many times was the wolf actually there? <clears throat> and recall represents of the times the wolf is there, how many times did the boy actually cry? And because I'm doing multi-categorical classification, because I have nine or 10 classes, this is done for each class category and then average together, unweighted. And again, the scores range between zero and one, where one represents a perfect score. So first, I have the classification accuracies for the different FCNs that I experimented with, using either with or without the additional sparse labels provided by the CNN. And I know there's a lot of numbers going on here, so please feel free to tune them out. Really, I just want you to focus on the colors because they represent the general trend that I want you to see. So first, we're gonna start with experiment one. This is the first column, and you can see that down the column, the FCNs that were trained with the additional sparse labels at the bottom performed better than those trained without, better than their counterparts, having an average increase of about 4%. For experiment two, uh, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, you can see that most of the FCNs improved, but some actually got worse, where the average increase was just about 1.5%. But then for experiment three, it looks like the general trend that we saw for experiment one, where all but one increased in score, having an average increase of about 2%. Last, I have the precision and recall. And you can see for experiment one, two, and three, the FCNs that were trained with the additional sparse labels tend to do better than their counterparts that were trained without the additional sparse labels, where the largest gains actually came from experiment three, which had an average increase of 10 and 8% for precision and recall, respectively, which is pretty cool, not gonna lie. So from this chapter, I have three key takeaways for you. The first being that these scores actually represent the baseline for performing semantic segmentation on the MLC data set. And given the methodology, the top scoring models actually performed within an acceptable range to be used in other ecological applications, which is promising for future studies that wanna emulate this one. The last is the validation for the use of a CNN as a way of adding sparse labels automatically to each image. This chapter showed that the additional sparse labels do increase the quality of the dense labels made by FASTMSS. But even better, the deep learning models trained on them are also likely to achieve uh, gains in classification accuracy. So it's pretty cool. And this is useful for chapter three, in which I transitioned from classifying 2D images of coral reefs to 3D photogrammetric models. Now, 2D images of coral reefs are great because they're easy to collect and they're becoming easier to annotate, but they fail to capture the three dimensionality of a reef, which is arguably one of the most important attributes. So since 2010, a lot of researchers have been moving towards what is called structure from motion photogrammetry. This is a computer vision technique that allows them to create an accurate 3D model of an object or a scene by using images taken from multiple vantage points. Now, this technique is non-invasive and it actually works pretty well in some habitats, but it fails to denote which portions of the model belong to a particular class category or functional group. So in this chapter, I demonstrate a novel method that does just that. So the data that was used to create the 3D model in this chapter was collected during the summer of 2019 in Chica Rocks, which is near the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary um, off the coast of the upper Matacambe Key of the Florida Keys. My co-advisor, Jen, and I were assisted in our data collection by Dr. Mark Butler of the Florida International University and his lab of graduate and undergraduate students. 
Our data collection consisted of using two GoPro Hero 7s mounted on a PVC frame about one meter apart, facing outwards parallel to each other. And we set, the video, we set the cameras to record video in 4K HD at 24 frames per second and in wide field of view mode. Before starting the survey, I placed 24 weighted coded targets around the site. These served as ground control points and would help in camera calibration and image alignment during later steps. So via scuba, I swam above the patch reef in a lawnmower pattern with the cameras looking downward at Vader. And then after uh, additional passes, I would increase the obliquity of the camera angle. And then finally, I just kind of swam around the patch reef and filmed inside of crevices and areas that might have been occluded from before. From this video footage, I extracted about 2,200 images by sequentially sampling one in every eight frames. So these images served as the data set for the remainder of this chapter. These images were used with AgiSoft MetaShape Pro version 1.6 to create a 3D photogrammetric model following a methodology similar to one that was outlined by Young et al. 2018. Because I used wide field of view mode in, uh, with the GoPros, I set the camera calibration profile to fisheye lens, and I used the detect marker tool to try to identify the center of each coded target found within each image. The images were aligned to create what is called a sparse point cloud, and then using the depth maps that were created as a result, I made a dense point cloud. Um, I then created a shaded mesh, and then finally a textured mesh. This consisted of about 10 million vertices that covers an area of about four meters squared and 1.5 meters in height. The ground resolution was 0.278 millimeters per pixel and the reprojection error was about 1.62 pixels. I then added scale to the model by providing some of the real world dimensions to some of the coded targets, which gave an estimated accumulative error of about 1.4 millimeters. So, Pretty good. If you haven't seen it and you get a chance, you should check it out in the data viz lab after COVID. It's, it's pretty cool. Now, up until this point, there's been no machine learning involved in creating this 3D, photo, 3D photogrammetric model, just regular structure from motion photogrammetry. And this has been done by many ecologists before me. But while working with Metashape, I learned a few things. One of them being that if I had a corresponding set of dense labels for every single image used in the reconstruction process, I could swap the two and then reuse some of the metadata that was made during the reconstruction process to create a 3D photogrammetric model. However, it would require a set of dense labels for every single image used in the reconstruction process. And if done manually, it would require a substantial amount of time on my part. And being a lazy person, I didn't wanna do this, but I knew that by working with chapters one and two, I could use those techniques to my advantage to actually streamline the process and make it way more efficient. So instead of creating sparse labels using the traditional point count method, my other co-advisor, Yuri, created this awesome patch extraction tool, which as you can see, it has a graphical user interface that allows the user to move the mouse around freely to extract highly representative samples of each class category of interest. So using this tool, I extracted about 10,000 training patches from images that were randomly sampled from the data set. From these images, I defined seven class categories for this study, four of which are biological, including branching, fish, massive coral, and algae, of which each of these has multiple species that I did not differentiate between. I also have a class to represent all of the potential types of substrate and one to denote where the coded targets were within each image. And finally, I have sort of a catch-all background class, which is used to represent the parts of the image that I cannot identify, cannot identify, because of light attenuation. Sorry. So to summarize this workflow, I use the patch extraction tool to extract highly representative samples of each class category, which were then used to train a CNN. Once it was trained, I went back to every single image in the data set and uniformly extracted about 2,800 patches following a grid formation. For each patch, if the confidence score associated with the prediction was higher than the threshold value that I set, then the presumed class label would be passed to where the patch was originally extracted from in the image. So very similar to what I did in chapter two. Now from these sparse labels, I used FastMSS to generate a uh, corresponding set of dense labels. And again, just as in chapter two, I wanted to experiment with different FCNs. So I fed these to them 
And once they were trained, I actually provided all of them with all of the images to create another corresponding set of dense labels. So to be clear, I now have six sets of dense labels for each method that I used. But before using any of these to create a 3D classified model, I wanted to be able to assess their accuracy and also the accuracy of the sparse labels that I created. So to do this, I went back to my data set and I extracted about 50 images randomly and I provided them with ground truth dense labels by using the image annotation software called Labelbox. So on the right, this is an example of a ground truth version that I created by hand for the corresponding image. For each set of dense labels that I had, I created a separate 3D classified model by performing the following steps. First, I duplicated my original project, which copied over all of the metadata that was created during the reconstruction process. I then swapped, with, uh, swapped the corresponding labels with the images using the change path tool. And then uh, I was able to create a classified textured mesh with those dense labels as the source images by simply building the texture again, which reused the existing UV or texture coordinates to map the textures from the dense labels instead of the original images. I was then able to create a classified shaded mesh using the colorized vertices tool, which mapped the color component values uh, within the pixel indices of the dense labels to the mesh. And then finally, I created a classified dense point cloud using the colorized dense point tool, which did something very, very similar. Now at this point, with the shaded mesh and the dense point cloud, I could actually export them with their classifications to be used in some other sort of spatial analysis software like ArcMap or ArcScene or something that you might be more familiar with. But before doing that, again, I wanted to be able to assess the accuracy of the classifications that were actually given. So to do this, I took the classified textured mesh and I exported it as a 2D image. This is commonly referred to as a texture atlas within the computer graphics community. And conceptually, this could be thought of as unwrapping the textures from the textured mesh and then projecting them onto a 2D plane, not unlike how you would project uh, a globe onto a, a map. So I did this for both the classified texture atlas and also the original texture atlas. And because these are just 2D images at this point, I was actually able to create a ground truth texture atlas by making a copy of the original, but then providing it with labels manually using Labelbox. However, the caveat here is that as you can see in the texture atlas, there's a lot of parts that are really hard to differentiate between. So as the annotator, I only chose to annotate the portions of the atlas that I was absolutely confident about. So this resulted in about 88% of all of the atlas being provided with labels, and the other 12% would be excluded from the analysis. In this chapter, this consisted of comparing the sparse labels, the dense labels, and the texture atlases against the ground truth versions that I created. For metrics, I chose to use pixel accuracy, mean pixel accuracy, and intersection over union. And for this chapter, I used dice coefficient score, which is the same as F1 score, if you're familiar, which is just the harmonic mean between precision and recall. And you can see that the score is calculated um, using the following equation. So moving on to the results, I first have the classification accuracies of the sparse labels made by the trained CNN. And you can see in table four, I have the percentage of sparse labels accepted and their classification accuracies as a function of the confidence threshold value chosen. So in the table, you can see that there's an inverse relationship between the confidence threshold value and the percentage of labels accepted. And this is because if you set the confidence threshold value to be something very conservative, like 0.99, you're basically rejecting all of the labels that the, that the CNN is not sure about. But this also creates a direct relationship between the confidence threshold value and the accuracies. Because again, if you reject most of the labels that the CNN is not sure about, then overall the accuracies are likely to increase as a result. So while working on the workflow, I saw these results and I decided to stick with a confidence threshold value of 0.5 because based off these results, they looked like a good balance between the percentage of labels accepted per image and their accuracies because again, it's an important trade-off between the two. Next, I have the classification scores for the dense labels made from those sparse labels that you saw in table five using FastMSS and also the dense labels that were made by the different FCNs that I experimented with. You can see that except for B2, 
all of the FCNs performed better than FastMSS with regards to accuracy. And with regards to speed, all of the FCNs performed significantly faster than FastMSS, whose recorded time also includes how long it took to create the sparse labels for the input image. So the difference in accuracy between the FCNs and FastMSS is small, but it suggests that as a deep learning algorithm, an FCN has the potential to develop a better understanding of each class category by learning from the images in the data set collectively. This is in contrast with FastMSS, which really can only propagate the label that it is given outwards towards neighboring pixel indices. So this with the speed sort of highlights why researchers should be moving towards deep learning as a form of image annotation. And finally, I have the classification accuracies for the 3D models that were made from the dense labels that you saw in table five. So again, there's a similar trend. The FCNs tend to perform better than fast MSS, but the difference among them is not really substantial. But what is interesting is because these scores are so similar to what we saw in table five, it actually suggests three things at a minimum. The first is that Agisoft Metashape Pro does a fairly good job of mapping the textures and the dense labels to the 3D model. This one sort of has to be true, otherwise nobody would be using the software for photogrammetry purposes, which is just, yeah. The second is the classification accuracies of the 3D models are largely dependent on the classification accuracies of the dense labels that were used to make them. Again, this sort of provides positive validation for something that was already assumed to be true, but because we can see that in the data, it's very promising. And the last thing is the non-conventional ground truth texture atlas that I created is of similar quality when compared to the more conventional ground truth images that I created. This provides validation that for future studies, people might be able to use the texture atlas as a form of ground truth like I did in this chapter as a way of validating the 3D accuracies, sorry, the accuracies of the 3D model, which is kind of cool. So from this chapter, I have two key takeaways for you. The first being that uh, by using deep learning algorithms, researchers can drastically reduce the amount of time, effort, and cost of providing annotations to images of coral reefs. Um, and a quick comparison shows that the traditional method of using coral point count manually costs the user on average six seconds per label, whereas a CNN could perform 200 labels per second automatically. And in the same time, an SCN can create a set of dense labels. Next is the novel method for classifying 3D photogrammetric models. Because it utilizes the metadata that was created during the reconstruction process, each set of dense labels, sorry, each image only needs to be given a set of dense labels once, meaning that this method scales linearly, which is nice if you're working with very large models or models with high resolution. And also, because these 3D classifications exist the resolution that they do, it opens up new opportunities for researchers to be able to study the 3D community composition of a reef, but also how the changes in community composition affects the physical structure, which is really interesting because it's something that hasn't been done before. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and conclude this presentation. This thesis shows that machine learning and computer vision algorithms can be used to aid ecologists by augmenting their existing data sets, but also they can actually learn from them so they can perform their own analysis. By using these algorithms, researchers can alleviate the bottleneck and allow them to scale up in terms of study size. And because they can be applied to 3D photogrammetric models, new types of analysis can be done. However, there are of course limitations to machine learning. Um, three of the which come to mind really quickly are um, if you're going to perform this underwater, even if you're gonna do it above land terrestrially, the quality of the images is still extremely important and therefore should be moderately consistent where possible. A common phrase in machine learning is garbage in, garbage out. Although these machine algorithms can perform some really sophisticated and cool things, they can still be really fragile and kind of dumb. And therefore it's your responsibility to ensure that you can spoon feed them data so that they're able to learn the right things. In chapter three, I only used seven functional groups. Uh, this was mostly to demonstrate proof of concept. If you're an ecologist and you want to do something like this, you can of course use more class categories to have a higher level of granularity, 
Um, but with more classes, you need to ensure that the training data sets that you are creating are accurate. Otherwise, the model will be learning the incorrect labels. And finally, the one that's probably more important than the other two is for a lot of people, machine learning might seem a little esoteric because of the assumed learning curve that's associated with it. I will say machine learning takes a long time or it takes a bit of time to get into, but it seems like every single day, more and more people are learning and creating resources and tutorials and software that make it, for, make it easy for others to sort of use it for themselves in their own analysis and in their own domains. So if you're someone who is interested in moving in this direction, I have a list of image annotation software tools with machine learning embedded in them. So you can use it without having to program. And there's also many, many others that I can share with you if you're interested. But with that, I'm gonna go ahead and conclude this presentation. But first I wanna thank NOAA, the University of New Hampshire and the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping for the funding and resources that made this research project possible. I really enjoyed this project. I thought it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot of cool things and I met a lot of cool people. And I'm really happy that I was given the opportunity to do this. Um, a big thanks to Dr. Mark Butler and his lab of graduate and undergraduate students, but especially Emily, Nick, and Samantha, who were essential in collecting the data for chapter three. And they're also just fun people to hang out with. Um, a big thanks to Oscar Baybaum, who created the MLC data set as part of his PhD dissertation that made mine and other people's studies possible. So thank you for that. And then finally, a big thanks to my advisors, Dr. Yuri Rajanov, uh, Jim Dykstra, and Kim Lowell for just everything that they've done. They've been fantastic advisors. They've helped me with guidance for the research and also the writing. Thank you for that. Um, and I have a great team. Like I have nothing but good things to say about them. So uh, for those of you who are interested, I have references. I have the uh, different software libraries that I used for my thesis. This is pretty much all of them. I didn't really use much outside of this. If you're interested in talking about the hyperparameters or the training specifications, I've got the information that we can talk about. And again, for those of you who are interested in getting a machine learning, but you're not quite ready to dive in with the computer programming, um, I've got a list here. Again, I have many, many others. These are just what I chose to show because to me, they represent uh, good quality stuff. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and conclude. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be around. Thanks. That was great, Jordan. Really nice talk. Um, so yeah, so we're open to questions. I think there is one question now. How far must be go gone before these algorithms can be applied to ROV observations in real time? Do you think that deep sea versus shallow applications will require different approaches as this method evolves? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that these techniques can be applied to ROVs already. Depends on exactly what you're talking about. If you want it to be performing in like real time, or if you just want to be applying it to kind of deep sea habitats, if you're using optical imagery, it should work. Uh, whether you're at the shallow or the deep, things might be different because you have different lighting. If you're in shallow areas, maybe you choose to use strobes or maybe you just use the natural light. Um, but as you go deeper, you're gonna have strobes. Um, color of images, is kind of a topic of debate. Um, a lot of people that use machine learning algorithms argue that color isn't necessarily that important of a feature that can be used to differentiate between class categories. Um, but perhaps it could be, maybe it doesn't hurt. But as far as being able to apply it to shallow versus deep, um, I think we're already there and you can definitely use it. Um, and I think with ROVs that have control uh, moving around underwater habitats, you could actually perform photogrammetry um, in those deep sea habitats as well. Any other questions? Uh, how much did you explore an application uh, into GIS? That's a good question. Um, so for, for any of these chapters, I actually didn't do much GIS in the terms of providing like the actual coordinates like GPS wise to it. I think in chapter three, it would have been beneficial to have put out um, known markers with GPS. How you would do that, um, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but I think by having those included in the photogrammetry process, the accuracy or the precision of the 3D model made would be higher. 
Um, with the coded targets, I will say, if you're someone who is getting involved in photogrammetry, I found these absolutely essential. Um, it did a really good job. I think about 95% of all of the images aligned. And as you can see, the results are pretty good. But if you did include GPS, um, I think it would improve higher. It definitely wouldn't get worse. But regards with, to GIS, that's all I did. I, Jen and I have started looking at exporting the models with their classifications to be used in other analysis. And so far, it looks pretty straightforward. We're exporting DEMs with their classifications and then performing um, bathymetric sort of roughness analysis on them. So it's looking pretty good so far. Um, Brian has a question. Brian, I'm trying to give you, Jerry, I think you have to give Brian access. Oh, no, I think I've got it, Jen. Oh, do you? Okay, great. Yeah. So Jordan, that's, that's really interesting stuff. Um, one of the big problems with all sort of machine learning techniques is whether they scale and move. So if you train a model for, you know, this reef, for example, uh, do you think it would work on the next reef over or the one a kilometre away? Or is it something where it needs to be trained specifically for the areas that you're interested in? That's a great question. Um, so during our, our field trip out to the Keys, we collected data from multiple patch reefs all located within the same area. So they all have different slightly shapes, but overall the functional groups or the class categories are similar. If I wanted to apply the same deep learning model on the different patch reefs, it would still work. However, because I chose to annotate, um, there might be things that are within the data set that I used, but is not there in another patch reef. So in which case I would actually need to go sh make sure that for each data set, for each patch reef, I encompass all of the class categories that might be present or create a background class to represent those. But yeah, I think the ability to generalize, it can be used in other patch reefs around the area. Um, of course, the more data that you provide of different patch reefs, even the better the ability for it to generalize. But at this point in time where it's at right now, I think mine can, and I think in general, if someone were to do the same thing, they should be able to generalize, yes. So if you wanted to generate like a, a super class of all of the classifications that would happen in a, in a region, that would probably be better then, right? So if we had multiple examples of patch reefs with maybe different things on them, and you did one set of, uh, one classifier, one network for all of them together, then that would give you much better chance to generalize in a, over wider areas. So it's, is, it just, is it just a matter of, of having more examples? So that's a good question. And I think it kind of depends. Um, I think in some situations- That's, a, that's it, always a safe answer when you're talking about statistics. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last part. <laughs> it depends is always a safe answer when you're talking about statistics. So it, I think it depends on the situation and also the data set and all the different class categories. And there's a couple of other factors that you might have to consider. But I think generally, if you have data of, of a, if we were talking about this particular area that we're talking about, um, the patch reef, I think that it would probably be better to collect all of the data and create one classifier based off of that. However, you could run into situations where it might be beneficial to have um, almost like a hierarchy or you have a cascade or you have different classifiers based on different situations. And then you can pass the data to one classifier or another based off of a precondition. But again, in this situation, based off of what I'm experienced with this site, I think it would be a good idea to collect data overall from the entire area and create one classifier. But again, to do that, you would have to ensure that you collect enough data and you're able to identify all of the different class categories that might be present. <clears throat> because if you don't, if you go to a particular area and you go to the next site and there's class categories that it's not sure of, you need to have a method to say like, hey, if you're not sure, let me know that you're not sure. Don't try to misclassify this because no matter what, it's going to classify something that it sees as something as it knows, even if it's not right. So there's, it's still fragile in that sense. Yeah, adding an I don't know class is, is always important in these sorts of things, so it doesn't get too confident in it. <laughs> I, I'm really thinking about the, the, uh, the efficiency of doing this. If you have to just define a, a new network for every patch reef you come across, that's not going to help that much. So it, you know, generalization is really important. <laughs> Thanks for your answers. Thank you for the questions. I appreciate it. All right, so we have uh, one question from Hong Kong. And I'm going to ask that person to 
talk. So unfortunately, I don't think I can pronounce your name. Vrico, how's it going, Vrico? Okay, great, <laughs> perfect, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, great job. And I'd like to ask, because you've been to Hong Kong and our corals are heavily eroded and there's a lot of bow eroders and they're of weird shapes. Do you think your algorithm can pick up the bow eroders or just the heavily eroded colonies? Uh, that's a really good question. And I think it would be a pretty cool application to try. I don't think in its current state, it could do that just because it's not trained on those class categories. But if the bio erosion or the kind of turbation that occurs because of those organisms, if it's visually different than the rest of uh, the area, I think you might be able to pick it up. But whether or not you want to perform semantic segmentation or maybe object detection, um, that would be something that you would have to look at. But I think, yes, I, I don't, I'm trying to visualize what it looks like based off of what I remember. And if it's kind of like this coral patchery for where you just have areas that it's exposed coral and it's kind of died and now it's just kind of turf algae or something else, you should be able to do it, yeah. Very cool, thank you. Thanks for the question, Rico. Hope you're doing well. So I think that begins to answer Brandon's question, but um, Brandon, would you like to answer, uh, to ask your question? I've given you access. Oh yeah, sure. Um, Great. I was just wondering how many photos would you need, say, of that um, patchy coral area to start distinguishing these um, fairly similar features, you know, like, say, algae and coral. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not too familiar with uh, coral reefs and all that, but are you talking hundreds of images, thousands, tens of thousands before you can start doing some good classification? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, uh, when it comes to machine learning and deep learning, it, uh, it's data driven and therefore the more data typically, the better the results you get. There's caveats there, but in general, you wanna have more. Um, and for a lot of people, machine learning or deep learning might be a turnoff because they assume that they need lots of data. And although it's true that you need more data for the model to be able to generalize, for this particular patch reef, the semantic segmentation model was trained on 2,200 images or about 2,180. But um, the classifier, the CNN, was trained on about 10,000. I didn't perform an analysis where I looked at, you know, how good is the accuracy with only this number of images versus this number of this number and this number uh, and saw at what point it reached an equilibrium. But with 2,200 images, it does fairly well. Um, and I would be willing to bet that uh, this particular model could perform still pretty good, even with like 1500 images, which is really not that much. Um, but yeah, definitely the more, the better. The more yeah. Better. Gotcha. Cheers, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right, Chris Seaton, you had another, oh, sorry. You had another question. I did have another question. It, Jordan just kind of went over it. Um, yeah. But it, it led me to think of another one. Could a similar uh, like deep learning method be used to actually uh, ascertain what would be a good quality image versus a poor quality image? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. Um, there are, so there's some non deep learning algorithms that you can use to do that. And they try to estimate the amount of blur. Um, and there's some techniques that uh, they may or may not work, but they use it in photogrammetry where they, in, they intentionally try to increase the contrast to make it easier for particular features to stand out and therefore it makes it easier for the images to align. So you could try to do something similar with, um, I don't necessarily think that you need deep learning to do that, but you can do it to images using different image processing techniques, but there are other deep learning algorithms that are used like super resolution which actually uh, similar to what you would see in CSI forensics where they're kind of like enlarging and enhancing, like that's not real, but nowadays there's something that is getting closer to that. So there are definitely deep learning ways to enhance images or maybe to be able to differentiate between good and bad quality. Um, I tried super resolution, but I didn't see a significant increase in the accuracy of my model. So that might just be sort of anecdotal, but yeah, there are definitely ways that you can do differentiation between good and bad images as a sort of like a pre-check. Yeah, it's a good question. And one final question from Alex. Uh, well, maybe two more questions, but uh, one question from Alex. Alex, I think Alex Brown, you're good to go. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Alex, I can hear you. Awesome. Uh, so first of all, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, that was cool. 
Um, but so you had um, in chapter two, a few models kind of chained together, like, you know, predicting the, um, the, the dense classifications and stuff. Um, have you analyzed at all how misclassification errors might propagate through that whole pipeline? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so the two conditions that I set for the MLC data set, I have the confidence threshold value, which basically just says some labels can be passed through and some can't. And then along with ensuring that you know, that presumed class label needs to already be within the list of ground truth labels. My reasoning for doing that was because initially when I was looking at the results of the sparse labels and then when FastMSS generates them, uh, the dense labels, you could see some like errors and some differences and you're like, oh, that's not great. So there is potential for error to start in the first step when you're actually training the CNN to produce sparse labels. And then there is potential for error to be produced by the FastMSS when it generates dense labels. So there's two points right there off the bat where you have two types of error. And that's the reason why in chapter three, I chose the threshold value based off of ground truth results, because I wanted to limit that amount of error before I got passed on to the next step. <clears throat> um, but when actually looking at the results of the MLC data set, I didn't include it in this, in this presentation, but I have it in my thesis. You can actually see the misclassifications on the dense labels. They're compared to the sparse labels. And a lot of the parts that were actually misclassified were always near the borders between two semantic groups, which is something that's kind of to be expected because when you're performing semantic segmentation, the transition from one class to the other isn't necessarily concrete, right? There's always like kind of a fuzzy boundary and it always seemed like those spots is where the model was most likely going to be wrong. But, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I have for that. Sorry. That's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I appreciate it. And I think um, this question is from Massimo. Yeah, I, I've seen the question from Massimo. All right, Massimo. I think I've just given you... Um... Can you hear me? Yeah, Massimo, what's going on, buddy? Thank you. It was very good presentation. Good work. I was wondering uh, how did you deal with the tuning of high, high parameters? Did you did it like try and error or did you use some automated tool? To yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, that's a really good question. So for, for those of you uh, for machine learning and deep learning, hyperparameters are just kind of, uh, there are additional parameters that you need to set and they can really affect the training and accuracy of your resulting model. Uh, typically, you split the data up in different sets, training, validation, and tests. So that way, when you mess with the parameter values, you don't accidentally have your model um, overfit. For me, because I was experimenting with different FCNs, all of them of different size, different number of parameters, I tried to keep as many variables constant as possible, including the image size and then also hyperparameters. So what I think I actually did was I chose a set of hyperparameters that seemed to do pretty good for one model. And I, I'm regretting saying this now because I'm thinking about it. Um, I probably used those same hyperparameters for every single model. And again, I wanted to be consistent across the board because I didn't want to give preferential, I didn't want to have to choose hyperparameters for each individual model because it would have been extremely complicated. But I guess as a matter of fact, I gave preference to some others, more than others. Um, but looking at the results, you could probably get even higher scores if you chose one particular model and then you focused on training the hyperparameters. To choose them, it was kind of, um, it was an art. It was very heuristic. I didn't use any grid search or um, auto keras or anything like that. Yeah, it was just kind of, let's see what happens and what works. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. All right, I think, uh, I think that's, uh, that's it for questions. So thank you all for participating um, and yeah. Um, I think if I can ask the committee to stay on, then uh, we can ask our questions. Cool. Thanks for coming, everyone. I really appreciate it.